Lord was given the choir. We've got your Bible with us. Let us go to the Gospel of John. John chapter 7 is where we're going to be this morning. John chapter 7 is where we'll be this morning. We continue our sermon series through the Gospel of John. We covered verses 1 through 36 this morning. John chapter 7, verses 1 through 36 this morning. The title of this morning's message is uh, Boldly Operating on God's Timetable. Boldly Operating on God's Timetable. In Bible times, there were three uh, great feasts, Jewish feasts, that were held every year, and any male was required to attend those feasts. One of those was Passover. Remember the story in the Old Testament where they uh, sacrificed the Passover lamb and had to ply the door over uh, the blood over the doorpost, and the death angel passed over them. That particular feast was held in the spring, and then there was Pentecost. Pentecost took place 50 days after Passover, and then there was a fall festival, a fall celebration called the tabern uh, Feast of the Tabernacles or Feast of the Booths. Uh, they would build little uh, shacks, if you will, out of uh, twigs and sticks, reminding them of their journey through the wilderness. And that's the setting of where we are in John chapter 7 this morning. We find here, so from chapter 6, where Jesus has fed the 5,000 men, plus the women and the children, he has given his bread of life sermon, and we saw last Sunday night thousands of them walked away from him, never to follow him anymore. Six months has passed now. It's fall, and we find Jesus here in this setting of the, of the Feast of Tabernacles or Booze in the fall of the year. Now, beginning here in chapter 7, and as we finish out the Gospel of John, now the tensions are really going to rise between Jesus and the religious leaders. Their hatred for Jesus is growing every time they encounter him, and we'll see that multiple times they're going to try to arrest him because they simply just cannot stand Jesus. All this is in accordance with God's divine plan as Jesus is heading to the cross, and we see all this beginning to unfold here, beginning in chapter 7. Now, we see here in the beginning of our text this morning, Jesus now is going to make a decision to stay in Galilee because the Jewish leaders want to kill him. Now this chapter teaches us several things this morning. Uh, one thing it teaches us is this. Jesus was determined to do God's will and he didn't care who didn't like him anyways. Amen. He was determined to carry out God's divine plan to redeem humanity no matter who did or did not like him. Now listen, this is key to us today. You and I are just beginning to see a culture who is increasingly intolerant of Christianity. We live in a culture who can't stand you if you like the Bible. We live in a culture if you like Jesus, they can't stand you. We can learn several things from Jesus here from our text this morning because I'm here to tell you, you and I haven't seen anything yet about what's going to take place in America. The floodgates of, uh, of anarchy have been opened and we're going to see a traumatic and dramatic, uh, a rapid increase in the intolerance of Christianity in the Bible. And you and I better be ready. You better make up your mind today. Am I going to live and stand? Am I going to live according to and stand on God's Word? Or am I going to be like some of that bush last Sunday night in John 6, 66 who walks away never to follow Him anymore? You're going to have to make up your mind. It's coming. It's coming quickly to this country. You're going to make your mind up. And you need to be like Jesus here and make your mind up. I'm going to do what the Father wants me to do. I don't care how unpopular it is. So there's a lot for us to learn here from Jesus here this morning. The world is going to hate you and I just as it hated Jesus. Isn't that what he told us? So be ready. Let's have prayer and we'll dive in together for the sake of time. Father, we ask you to bless your word this morning. We thank you that Jesus has given us an example to obey you and follow you even when the world around us doesn't like it. When it's unpopular, when it's insensitive according to them. All these things, Father, help us now 
to make up our mind like Jesus to stand for you and live for you in a day and an age where people cannot stand you. Lord, I ask you to bless your word this morning. I pray you'll speak to our hearts. And we pray, Father, that your will be done in this service. Maybe some lost soul will be saved. Some believer who's sitting on the fence today would get committed and, and consecrate yourself to you from here on out. In Jesus' name we ask these blessings. And amen. amen. I want you to notice three things here with me this morning from our text. First of all, I want you to notice here with me his clear agenda from the sovereign. His clear agenda from the sovereign. Now, we find there, I'm not going to read all 36 verses for the sake of time. Uh, you can read those, uh, every one of them on your own time if you like to. But we find there in verses 3 and 4 that Jesus' brothers, his half-brothers, his earthly brothers. Now, let me stop just a moment there. If Jesus had brothers, that tells me that, that uh, Mary didn't remain a virgin, did she? Now, now that may be blunt, but I say this for a reason. The Catholic Church venerates Mary into a place of where she is to be worshipped. She is not to be worshipped because she's a sinner just like you and me. You don't believe it? Read the Gospel of Luke there and you hear her confess her need of a Savior and the magnificent that she sings. We find her Jesus' his earthly brothers tell him, Jesus, if you're going to do all these signs and wonders, if you want everybody to know who you are, if you want the world to catch on who you are, you don't need to stay here in Galilee with us. You need to go down to Jerusalem to the Feast of Tabernacles because there's going to be a big crowd there. Thousands of people would have made the trek to Jerusalem for this celebration. And that will give you a great stage in which to do your wonders and signs and everybody's going to be impressed and carried away with you. But here's the problem with his earthly brother's suggestions. Verse 5 says they didn't believe in him either. Listen, his own family did not believe he was the Son of God. They did not believe in his signs and his wonders. But even though they make the suggestion, they're not believers themselves. But here's the thing. In spite of the skeptics, in spite of the doubters, Jesus made his mind up, I'm going to do what the Father sent me to do, and I don't care what everybody else thinks. You see, he had a clear agenda from God. You see, you and I get off track in our lives because we're too worried about what everybody else thinks. We're too worried about getting everybody else's approval. We're too worried about how we're going to be viewed. Listen, what matters in life is this. You and I do what the Father asks us to do. I want you to notice two things here Jesus is clearly committed to and it comes to regard to His Father's agenda. First of all, if you notice here, He's clearly committed to God's timing. He's clearly committed to God's timing. Now look at verse 6. His brothers have just said, hey, you need to go to Jerusalem, put on, uh, put on display your signs and wonders, and, and everybody's going to just be, uh, you know, really love this. Look what He says in verse 6. My time is not yet come. You find that phrase often throughout the Gospel of John. Jesus says, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. In other words, hey, if you guys want to go to the Feast of Tabernacles, you can go anytime you want to, but I'm on God's timetable, and it's not time for me to go to Jerusalem yet. See, in John's Gospel, we often read this phrase of the hour or the time was not yet. What Jesus is saying is this, I'm operating on God's timetable. And on God's plan, it's not time for me to go to Jerusalem yet. It's not time for me to go and show my signs and wonders in Jerusalem yet. You see, his brothers thought, hey, well, this is a great time for you to make your big splash, to make a big appearance here, and you'll gain all this great uh, notoriety. But here's the thing. Jesus says, I'll do it on God's time. I'm not going to do it on your time. It don't matter what you think, bub. Brother, it don't matter what you think, I'm operating on God's timetable. You see, Jesus was in absolute control of His life, but here's the thing, He had surrendered His life to the timetable of God. He didn't do things when He thought He ought to or when He wanted to. He operated according to God's timing. You see, let's be honest this morning. Many times as believers, we don't like to operate on God's timetable, do we? We thank God runs a McDonald's drive through Hurry up and give it to me. I mean, we, we expect them to cook chicken nuggets start to finish in no time. From the time we push the button 
until we get to the window, we think they ought to have all them nuggets done at 165 degrees internal temperature. They ought to have everything I want right here, right here. Listen, God don't run a McDonald's or a Burger King. He does things according to His time. Amen? Amen. But so many times as believers, we want God to do things faster than He does. We want God to hurry up and do things. You see, Jesus didn't have a whole lot of time left on earth. He's got about a year or six months or so left here and He's going to the cross. But even though He didn't have a lot of time left, He said, I'm going to use my time and do what God tells me to do it when God tells me to do it. Can I give you a piece of free advice this morning? You go a whole lot better off to do things on God's timetable. Amen. You're a whole lot better off to do things on God's timetable than you are to do it on your timetable. Jesus was clearly committed to God's time. Secondly, He was clearly committed to His own trial. Jesus' trial. He knew. Notice what else He said to His brothers there in verse 7. He said, The world cannot hate you, but it hateth me, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. You see, Jesus knew that when He went to Jerusalem, and really, uh, and we'll see in a moment here, He begins to speak the message He's supposed to speak. They're not going to all jump up and embrace Him and say, Glory to God, we're so tickled you're here. They're going to be angry and irate at Him for His message. And you see, He knew His coming to earth would remind the world of their sin and failure and they would hate Him for it. You see, Jesus was the light of the world. Remember what He told Nicodemus in chapter 3? He says, men love darkness more than the new light. You know why our society can't stand Christianity and the Bible and Jesus? It's because they love darkness. When you preach Jesus and you preach the Word of God, you shine light into their darkness and they don't want you turning the light switch on. Amen. And they're going to be mad at you when you share the gospel with them. They're going to be mad at you when you play gospel music and when you talk about Jesus. They don't like that because they love sin and darkness more than they do light. You see, the world hated the light of Jesus and, and Jesus knew all this was coming. He knew the world would hate Him and He knew they would reject Him and He knew they would want to kill Him. He knew His trial was coming. He knew they would lay hands on Him and arrest Him eventually. He knew all this was coming. You see, He knew He had to die for our sins. He was clearly committed to God's timetable. I'll do things when God tells me to. And I'm clearly committed to my trial. I'm going to be arrested, falsely accused, but that's what I've got to do to save James Hazelwood and the folks right here today. He was committed to doing God's work on God's timetable. And for those of us who are followers of Jesus here, here's a great, tremendous challenge. I've already alluded to it and mentioned it this morning. You and I have got to make up our minds. Are we willing to pick up our cross every day Die to ourselves and follow Jesus. Because it's not going to be popular. It's not always going to be looked upon favorably. You see, the world is going to mistreat you and uh, malign you because you have aligned yourself with Jesus. You see, listen, this morning, all across the world, Christians are persecuted. They have been in, they're in jail. They're being beaten. They're being tortured. They've lost their lives just because they follow Jesus. Do you realize across the other side of the world last night, people had churches down in dungeons with little old lights and hoping they didn't get caught? You and I stroll up in here like we own the place big and bold. We're proud to be at church. There's people across the world last night went to church on Sunday that don't have the freedom you and I have. You better get ready because it's coming to this country. You better make up your mind. Am I going to pick up my cross? Am I willing to follow Jesus even if I'm persecuted? Even if I have to die for Jesus? Am I willing to do that? You see, Jesus was committed to doing God's will even though it brought His death. Are you and I that committed for our faith? Most people aren't committed enough to get out of their air-conditioned house, <laughs> climb in an air-conditioned car, and come to sit in an air-conditioned building to hear a hot-winded sermon. 
<laughs> How you doing, brother? <laughs> we got a commitment for crisis in our churches. Not too many Christians are genuinely committed anymore to following Jesus. We're committed to checking off the box. I went to church Sunday morning, but we're not committed to following Jesus Monday through Saturday. You better make your mind up. You going to operate on God's timing? Or are you willing to do God's work? Let's move on here this morning. We see here that Jesus, and He was His clear agenda from the side. And second, I want you to notice here His courageous appearance at the synagogue. His courageous appearance at the synagogue. Now, even though his brothers it, it suggested to him to go to Jerusalem, he waited and went when he was told to go. And we find here, he goes to the Feast of the Tabernacles, and John says in verse 10, he comes in town in secret. He doesn't just stroll out through Main Street and say, all right, blow the trumpets, I'm here. Jesus slips into town. And as he slips into town, we find here that the secrecy was not because Jesus was afraid of the authorities, but Jesus had a purpose. Jesus had one purpose in going this trip to Jerusalem. It was to preach at the synagogue. If he went downtown, down the middle of town, and there would have been this great fanfare, he would not have been able to accomplish his mission, which is to preach this message in the synagogue. But notice here, John says in verses 11 and 12, the people are talking among themselves. Where is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus? Have you seen Jesus? There was a stir. There was a buzz around Jerusalem. Where is Jesus? And then in verse 13 it says, No man spoke openly of Him for fear of the Jews. The people were afraid to mention Jesus' name because they knew the authorities would get them. We find here that while the people were afraid, Jesus wasn't. You see, he had come to show off, but he also had not come to back up. That's all I love about Jesus. He don't back up. He ain't got a backup in him. He got no reverse. Notice here two things about his courageous appearance at the center of God. First of all, he courageously spoke his message. Verse 14 says, And towards the middle of the festivity, Jesus went into the temple and he started teaching. <laughs> Excuse me. John doesn't tell us what he said, but he does say this. Look at verse 15. Said the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters having never learned? They're saying, Hey, this guy's from Galilee. He hadn't been to seminary. How could he preach like that? How could he teach like that? Who is this guy to get up and preach like this? Who is this guy? You see, the Jews. And some of our churches today, the Jews thought, hey, if anybody's going to be a rabbi, they've got to go first go to school. I mean, churches today require their pastor to have schooling, seminary, or Bible college. Who is this Jesus guy? He had been to Bible college. He had been to rabbinical school. Who is this Jesus? Look at verses 16 and 17, what Jesus says. He says, my doctrine, my teachings are not mine, but his that sent me, if any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Jesus say, hey, you can try to uh, figure out who I am, what my authority is, but my message is not my message, it's his message. You know whose authority I stand on this morning? It's not James Hazel Woods. I'm here to tell you this is his message. Right. This isn't my message. This is God's message. Jesus said, hey, my message comes from God. And if you really were uh, aware of who God was, you would know what my message is. You see, our world today is questioning us. We live in a relative society today. In other words, what you think is right, the other person may not think it's right. In other words, there's no longer a standard of right and wrong. Our society no longer has... Black and white issues is right and wrong. There's a lot of gray in our society today. Our young people are raised to believe that way. What you think is right, somebody else may think is wrong. And, and there's no standard. Here's the, here's the problem. When you get away from the Word of God, there's no standard. This book tells us what's right and wrong. And our society has abandoned the Bible. And we no longer live by the Bible as absolute truth. And when you abandon the Bible, then it's what? It's anybody's game. <coughs> Let's just imagine tomorrow I start a new campaign that 2 plus 2 is 5. I'm going to protest. 
and I'm going to get a lawyer, and I'm going to get a lobbying group, and we're going to go to D.C., and we're going to change it. Two plus two is now five. You say, that's the most idiotic thing I've ever heard. Two plus two is four. It's always been that way and always will be. But our society has done something a whole lot more idiotic than that. We have left the standard of truth just as two plus two has always been four and always be will be four. The Word of God will always be true. Amen. You tell the society that no longer believes the Bible is the Word of God. Listen, this is very important. You ever run to a preacher don't believe this is the Word of God, you better run from Him. Amen. This is God's inerrant, infallible, inspired Word of God. And Jesus in our world today, they, they're going to question you. Where, where do you get your authority to say homosexual marriage is wrong? Where do you get your authority that divorce is wrong? Where do you get your authority that premarital sex is wrong? Where do you get your authority that lying and stealing is wrong? We get it right here. It's not my message, it's His. That's what Jesus is saying. My authority is not mine. My message is not mine, it's His. And that's what the world today, we must, we've got to make that stand. This is a hill we must die on. That the Bible is the truth. Amen. Even though our society doesn't believe it, you better be prepared to stand on it. Because God's Word is truth. You see, the gospel is not my message. It's His message. And what God says in His Word is truth. Amen. We've got to listen. You better be prepared to courageously speak His message. Because our world don't want to hear that. But this is where you better stand on His message. Secondly, <coughs> Jesus was not only in His courageous appearance in the synagogue, He courageously spoke His message, but He also courageously spoke of His ministry. Now, verse 18, Jesus made a very important point. He said that he that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. He, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true. And no unrighteousness is in, is, is, is in him. In other words, Jesus was saying that his ministry was to glorify the Father and not himself. Now, this was a jab at the religious leaders. You know what the religious leaders want to do? They want to look good. <coughs> Everything they do to make themselves look good. And to benefit themselves, Jesus says, hey, I didn't come to make myself look good. I come to obey the Father, do His will, and glorify Him. Jesus presses <coughs> His point home a little further. He reminds the crowd, some of the crowd didn't know this happened, but the religious leaders did. Remember back in chapter 5, when He healed the man by the pool of Siloam who had been crippled for 38 years? Remember, He healed him on the Sabbath day. And in Jewish times, that was taboo. <coughs> Man, there was an uprising when they found out Jesus had healed this man on the Sabbath day. But Jesus makes a good point. In verse 22, Jesus says, Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it's of Moses, but of the fathers, and ye on the Sabbath day circumcise him. Now, in Jewish law, a male baby boy was to be circumcised on the eighth day after his birth. Now here's Jesus' point. If the eighth day fell for him to be circumcised on the Sabbath day, you'd have a problem circumcising. If you don't have a problem circumcising a baby on the eighth day and you're taking care of one part of his body, why do you have a problem with me healing the whole body on the Sabbath mm -hmm. day? Oh, well, Jesus is a good argument. You, you didn't mind the circumcision of one part of a woman's body on the Sabbath day. Why do you have a problem with healing a man of his entire body on the Sabbath day? You see, in verse 23, uh, excuse me, verse 24, notice what Jesus said. Listen, you don't miss this right here. I love this verse 24. Jesus said, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Now here's what Jesus said. You're passing judgment on what I did on the Sabbath day because you're looking on the outside. You have no idea what I'm doing, what my purpose is. He says, if you're going to pass judgment on my work, you better be sure it's the right judgment. 
Now here's where I want to apply to you and I. How many of you have ever been told, judge not lest you shall be judged? Don't the world tell us that? Amen. The world says, don't you judge me. The Bible says, don't judge me. Well, listen, Jack, you didn't get all the verse. You didn't get the whole rest of the chapter. You took the part you liked and left the rest of it. Jesus here is simply saying this. When the world comes to you and I, and they look at this old crazy preacher and say, you're judging me, preacher. You're talking about my sin. You're judging me. I'm going to say, wait a minute, Jack. You better make a right judgment because you're looking on the external. The right judgment is the Word of God says your sin is a sin. I'm not passing judgment. The Bible says it's a sin. When people tell you not to judge them, you better say, hey, whoa, Jack, you better make the right call. You're not making the right call here. You're looking from your perspective on the outside. You see, the Jewish leaders on the outside thought Jesus was in the wrong. But who was wrong? They were. And the world oftentimes is in the wrong when it comes to judgment. You see, when the world challenges us, point them to the Word of God and say, here's your judgment. I'm not passing judgment on you. The Bible says that's wrong. The Bible says that's a sin. The Bible says it. You see, do you, you see Jesus' courage here? Jesus is courageously telling the religious leaders, you're in the wrong here, boys. I don't care what school you went to, what you think, you're looking externally upon me, and you've come to the wrong conclusion. He courageously speaks of his ministry in the face of opposition. Notice thirdly here, Jesus is boldly operating on God's timetable. He's got a clear agenda from the sovereign. He's not doing things when He wants to. He's doing things on God's timing. He's committed to the trial. He knows He must be falsely accused and arrested to die for our sins. We see here that he, His courageous appearance in the Son of God, He boldly and courageously pre preaches His message and speaks of His ministry. He don't care what they think and how much they don't like Him. But I was finding this morning His confident answer to the skeptics. His confident answer to the skeptics. Now, by this time, a crowd is growing. And you, you know, isn't it amazing? Anytime there's any kind of little ruffle, here comes everybody. You can imagine Jesus and the religious leaders having this exchange, and there's a crowd growing here. And before it's all over, both the crowd and the Jewish authorities want to arrest Jesus. Here's what I want you to see. Through all of this process, Jesus never backs up. He's confident, and He responds here confidently to His skeptics. Notice two things Jesus was confident about. First of all, He was confident about His relationship with the Father. He was confident about His relationship with the Father. Now the crowd here had been listening to Jesus teach, but they still didn't know exactly what they needed to do. And we find here in verse 26 that some of them thought He might be the Messiah, and, and then some of them dismissed the notion. They said, well, we know this guy. We know him all his life. We know his mom and daddy or his earthly father. He can't be the Messiah. But look at verse 28 here. It says that Jesus cried in the temple, that is, he lifted his voice loud and clear to hear over everybody's murmuring and all their suggestions. He raises his voice and knows what he says. Ye both know me, and you know whence I am, and I am not come of myself. But he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. But I know him, for I am from him, and he has sent me. Jesus, this is what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, you just think you know me. You think you know where I come from? You think I'm just the carpenter's boy? But I have come from the Heavenly Father. You see, why did Jesus cry out like this? Well, it's because they didn't really know the God that He come from anyways. They had no clue of who His God, His Father really was. You see, but Jesus said, hey, I come from God. I know Him intimately. He's from God. He's with God. And Jesus was that God. Amen? Amen. You see, in a world that's often blind to the Gospel, you and I believe and proclaim where people try to discredit us and dismiss us. They say, I've known you all your life. Who do you think you are? <coughs> I've known you since you were this tall. I know your past. 
I know all about you. Who do you think you are to share the gospel with me? Who you who are you telling me about sin in the Bible? You look at them and say, yeah, I got a relationship with the Father. I'm not perfect. Yes, I've got a past. Who doesn't? We've all, but you know what? Thank God mine's under the blood. I hope you can say that Amen. this morning. Amen. Hope you can say this morning, your past is under the blood of Jesus. Mine's under the blood of Jesus. That's what gives me the confidence to answer skeptics is I have a relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus is saying, I got a relationship. You and I say, you know what? I know God because I've met him and I'm one of his. Amen. I have a relationship with the Father. Notice secondly, Jesus here finally. He was confident about his return to the Father. Not only did he say, Hey, you think you know me? Well, I have come from the Father in heaven. But I'm also going to go back. I'm going to return to the Father in heaven. Now, when Jesus makes these statements here, the crowd didn't really know what to think. We also find them getting an awful answer here. They're not happy with Jesus. See, in Jewish thinking, what he just said about coming from God was blasphemy, and they begin to get angry. And we find verse 30 says, they sought to take him or lay hands on him, but no one did know what the rest of verse 30 says. For his hour was not yet come. Say again. They couldn't arrest Jesus because God said it wasn't time to. He was on God's timetable. They couldn't stand what He said. They wanted to arrest Him, but then He was on God's timetable. You see, but not everybody was against Him. Some of the crowd believed He just might be the Christ or the Messiah, verse 31 says. But when the Jewish leaders heard that, they said, hey, call the saw, call security. <laughs> call temple security. Call the synagogue security and have this man escorted out of the synagogue. What's happening here? Notice here when Jesus saw them all coming to him, verses 33 and 34, look what Jesus said. Yet a little while I am with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. You shall look for me, seek me, and shall not find me, and where I am through you cannot come. Now, the guards here tried to arrest him, but it's not time. Jesus knew the time was coming, but this wasn't it. You see, here's the thing. There was no fear of Him falling into their hands. The worst they could do and would do would be to crucify Him. And then hang on the cross in the blackness of that Friday, He would cry, Father, into Thy hands I commit my spirit. He would hang His head, give up the ghost, and He would die. They would wrap Him up, put His body in a barred tomb, and roll a stone over the door. But as S.L. Locker says, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. You see, Jesus knew all of this. But He also knew as He looked out on that hostile crowd that day that after crucifixion Friday would be resurrection Sunday. Woo! Hallelujah. You see, His dead, nail-pierced corpse would come back to life. And you know what He would do? After spending 40 days on the earth making various appearances to His followers, He would ascend into heaven in Acts chapter 1. You see, He says, Hey, I am leaving you in a short time and I'm going back to where I came from. Amen. I'm returning to the Father. Jesus was confident his relationship with the Father. When the world asks you who you think you are, say, hey, i got a relationship with him. But you know what? I'm not going to return to the Father. I'm going to go to him someday. Yeah. I told you last week, I heard a good sermon the other morning. Uh, I saw 43, and this is what the preacher said. Talking about the rapture and, and the trumpet. He said, when I hear the toot, I'm going to scoot. <laughs> Amen? Listen, one of these days, when I hear the toot, I'm going to scoot. Listen, when Gabriel blows the horn, I'm out of here someday, amen? Listen, I'm not returning to the Father, but I'm going to go to the Father, amen? You know why? Because I've got a relationship with Him through Jesus. Amen. That gives me confidence to tell the skeptics, hey, I'm not going to be here much longer. Either in death or the rapture, I'm out of here either way. Amen. You know... Jews didn't understand what he was talking about with the two scoop here. In verses 35 and 36, they said, well, where does he think he's going? Is he going to go somewhere else and teach a preacher why? What's, what's he talking about? I don't understand what he means here. 
You see, Jesus wasn't talking about just leaving the country and going somewhere else to teach. He's talking about leaving the world. Amen? And not forever. Look, here's what I want you to say this morning. Jesus says, I'm returning to the Father. But you know what else He promised He would do? He promised He'd come back. Are you ready for His return today? You see, I believe that the Bible teaches in an imminent return of Christ. What that means is, I believe He can come at any moment. I believe, very possibly, before Miss, Miss Kathy strikes the first chord on the piano, I believe Jesus could hit, hit the eastern sky today. Okay? Are you ready for His return today? If He comes, are you ready? You see, for those of us who are left here in the meantime, the hope we have that holds us up in the midst of this world who despises us and despises God and His Word and His Son Jesus, the hope that holds us up is what? Titus calls it the blessed hope. And what is that blessed hope? It's the return of Christ. Listen, I'm a winner either way. Whether I lose my life, Paul says, be absent from the body, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, be present with the Lord. Amen. Amen. If I don't die, the Lord comes back. Maybe He'll keep me right here about me at sermon someday. I'm a winner either way. But I ask you this morning in closing here, how about you this morning? Do you have that relationship with the Father? Can you confidently say, I have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ? Can you say that today? And if you can confidently say that, friends, you better be looking for His return. You better get your house in order. Get your bags packed. Take care of some things. If you got some grudges, you better be burying them and making them right. If you got some broken relationships, you better be making them right. You better take care of business. Listen, if you and I listen, if you and I live every day like it might be our last, the world will be a different place. Oh, yeah. Here's what we're doing. We're assuming we're going to go down here to the buffet in about 15 minutes. We're going to eat till we just about pass out. <laughs> then somebody had to help us to the truck, help us in the recliner. We're going to sleep about two hours like a dead man. <laughs> then we're going to get up. We're going to do something else. We just think we're going to do all that. Listen, folks, there's no guarantee of that. Brother Walter, Miss Kathy is going to come. Let me ask you this morning again. Can you confidently say, I have a relationship with the Father, with Jesus Christ? If you can't, maybe God's Spirit is... It's convicted your heart today about your need for Jesus. I'll be standing down front. I invite you to come to Jesus. But here, let me talk to you, to you believers for just a moment. Are you boldly operating your life on God's timetable? Jesus has given us a great example about boldly operating our lives on God's timetable. Will you stand for the gospel? Will you live your life according to God's will in the face of a world who's becoming more and more hostile? We've got to make that decision. Some of you today got to make a decision. Whose side are you on here? You can't straddle the fence. You've got to make your mind up. I'm, on, I'm going with Jesus. Or I'm going with the Word. You've got to make up your mind. As we stand and say, what number, Brother Walter? 156. 156 in the blue book this morning.